Okay, welcome to the Stage Left Podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. On this episode, we speak to writer, journalist and DJ Paul Gallagher, a man who's travelled the world DJing at festivals, gigs, nightclubs, after show events for the likes of the Sex Pistols, the Buzzcocks, Soul Wax Oasis and BDI. We'll be getting an insight into what it means to be a DJ in the digital age, how dance floor audiences differ around the world and how when only armed with his record collection, he went about the seemingly impossible task of appeasing a festival worth of disgruntled Oasis fans who'd just been told moments before the band had cancelled their headline slot and were officially splitting up for good. We'll also discuss how life might be different if it wasn't for the seismic cultural impact music in the 90s had on not only Paul but British society. I'll be asking Paul what it was like to be situated so close to a movement which, albeit brief, influenced fashion, art and even politics in the UK. I join Paul in North London where he's just returned from a UK and European tour as DJ for Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. How's it going, Paul? All right, mate. How are you? Very well. How's the tour? Uh, yeah, Ty- tiring. It's, it's one of them things, isn't it, getting on and off planes and staying up all night and... Well, you know, we get on with it. Do it for the kids. So, I, I, I mean, how does each audience vary when you play? Because I know that you did, I mean, I'm going to read out where the tour went. I think you did most of these. So, obviously, UK and Ireland, but you did Paris, uh, went to Milan, Berlin, Copenhagen. I, did, I, I skipped a few of them. Okay, because, Dusseldorf? Uh, I went to Dusseldorf, yeah. I missed Milan, and, and Milan, Copenhagen, and Berlin because it was Mother's Day weekend. Oh, right. I had to go see my mum. Priorities? It kind of got in. I would have stayed Paris and then gone from there, but. Yeah, priorities, isn't it? I'm poor so I was with Liam, so yeah, we, we had to do that. So, um, yeah, I missed Nottingham because we couldn't get a venue on a Friday night. Of all. <laughs> it, it, I, I was astounded that we couldn't get a venue, but that's just the way it is when you, when you, you do these things. I did, I did most of them. I did, I did Dublin, Dublin, Glasgow, Manchester, London, Paris, Dusseldorf. Cool. Um, and we'll carry on this summer. And, uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to the, few, the, the ones that are coming up. Um, Compare us, like, for us, give us a, com- a comparison of like how audience differ from city to city. Um, well, Glasgow they're mental, in Dublin they're mental, in Paris they're getting mental, London's usually the same, standoffish, kind of impress me kind of nonsense. Manchester was great on a Monday night, I mean, a Monday night in Manchester was blinding, it's better than some Saturday nights. <laughs> The, the audience is very, I mean... What about in Europe? Yeah, yeah Europe, Europe's interesting. Usually, usually Paris is full of British people, but not anymore, because I've, I've been doing Paris for a while, like on and off. But I, didn't do, I did it with BDI last year, and I did it with Noel this year, and I've done it on my own a few times. And <clears throat> yeah, It's pretty much Parisian and French, whereas you go to Germany and it's mostly British. So, yeah. And Milan, Milan is you know Italy. They're all metal. They just they just all people kids who are up for a good time. How does going to each city affect what you play? Do you ever try and um, change your set, take no. your set list over to no. no, no, they expect me to. But I just do what I want. I've run into a bit of trouble in uh, Germany, Cologne. Go on. When, when you know people ask you for the usual always no roses, I'm like leave me, leave, leave me alone. So then you they just. You know, start chanting and throwing bottles at you. Really? Yeah. But you know, hostile. It's like you're from forums for five years after the event. It's like, give me a break. Yeah, mud sticks apparently in Germany. Yeah. Um, okay, so as a, as a, you've obviously done proper tour DJs in the past for for lots of people. Talk talk through your day. Is it like it's got to be the best job ever, isn't it? Um, it is. Late, I mean, late on, start, late on, finish. On paper, it is. On paper, it's it is this, the next best thing to be in a band, but then you've got you've got to take into account. I mean, America for a DJ, waste of time, complete. You, you, your heart will be broke. Why? Because if, especially if you're following a, a band on tour, you're playing till what two, three in the morning. By the time you've got to sleep and wake up, because you haven't got tour bus, you haven't got all this thing in place. You're kind of doing it on uh, trains and whatever. Seven hours between each gig. And then by the time you turn up there, you know, their gigs on, and it's just it's basically a treadmill that you never get off. And I did the East Coast once and I said, never again, it's just, <clears throat> you make no money and it's just heartbreaking. Um, it te- costs you more. It costs you, yeah. It cost me to go to America. I'm really? Forget about oh, it. Yeah. Don't want to open up old rooms here, man. <laughs> um, 
So in regards to like you've obviously done stuff before bands have come on stage and that kind of thing. What's yeah. your role? What's your normal kind of like uh, your remit? Is it to whip the crowd into a frenzy? Or yeah, you depend well, on the artist? It, it's I mean the the pistols thing and the buzzcocks and that was kind of kind of eventful. We, we didn't get to DJ before the, the pistols. They wouldn't let us on the stage <laughs> for some bizarre reason. Um, they wanted the stage clear and they didn't want us anywhere near them. That was that. But um, for a punk gig, yeah, you kind of garage rocky kind of. 60s vibe because they're all kind of into that. You just make sure you don't play anything by any of the bands that are playing. Yeah, yeah. Because you were just looking at it, no bed. So yeah, just keep, just keep it, keep it lively. Keep it lively. And what about have you ever uh, DJ before a band who's kind of a bit more lo-fi? So you had to kind of alter what you're playing and not kind of rip with the crowd into a frenzy. Mm. Like you take the Black Rivers. I know when they were on. I know you didn't do it before. No, I didn't. Like that. No, I would. I do. Wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I mean, I did it before BDI and. But that was pretty good. Yeah, but we kind of the band had a lot of input into what I played because initially they let you go <coughs> do your own thing. But after a bit, they're like going, "Hey, what what was that you played?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, you know," and they go, well, "We don't like that song." It's not like, really. So we have a little bit of a. They yeah, no, at least they're involved. After about six weeks, they, they decide to can you play that. I'm like, well, what thing? You kind of you know give them a few songs. And just prove that it won't work, and then you just let you carry on on your own devices. So, um, and how do you balance when you do a lot of your DJ sets, the after shows? How do you balance playing what you like, you know, and what the audience wants to hear? Because I know you see you get a lot of people. Yeah, it, it, I mean, some geezer the other day asked me for the house Martins, and I said, "Listen, <laughs> mate, do you know what time it is?" And he was a British guy, and I was like, "The house Martins? Are you fucking DJs the house? Never, no." And then in Glasgow, there was some other lunatic asking me for Bucktown Funk by whatever he's facing, I said, yeah, there's the class, see you later. Give me the house DJ, but I'm going home. Um, sound funk. Fuck you know, no one, no, no one in the country is knackered. <laughs> uh, right, okay, um, when we uh, met in Paris, you got legitimately animated about DJs using USB sticks. Yeah, because it's just nonsense. I mean, when I, I grew up, you go to a record shop, you buy vinyl, you listen to you open it, you look at the cover, you listen to it, you play it at death, you know, every word of every song. You got the kids these days. You've got two USB sticks. Plug them in. Don't buy the records. Predominantly steal them. Download them from the internet. Most of them are pre-mixed. Some of them are not. I, like, I asked the DJ the other day. I said, "You got any music?" He went, "No." Really? Download off the internet. I was like, "You what?" I mean, I, I, I do CDs now because you wouldn't get on a plane with vinyl. And if you did get on a plane, your vinyl wouldn't be there when you got off. So, but that's as far as I go. Don't do laptops. You've you, you got to physically do something. What about the vinyl revival? Yeah, great. 30, 30 pound a record. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. I've got, I've got the originals. Crack, crack on with that. Um, okay, so tell us about what kind of stuff goes down best at your nights. It's a mixture. I mean, because I've done so much in all different cities, there's some people that like Northern Soul, there's some people that like Reggae, there's some people that like Scar, there's some people that like Rock and Roll, there's some that like Garage Rock. And they've all seen me at one point or another, so I kind of do a mixture of all them, and end up with rappers delight because I need a fag or yeah. two. It's 14 minutes long, and I can I can I can go to the toilet, have a fag, couple of six, come back. It's still <laughs> still got eight minutes left. It's great. Stockholm Monsters. Yeah, I checked them out. That's yeah. your Twitter handle, isn't it? Um, yeah, they're a band from Burnage, signed to Fancy Records in the 70s. <clears throat> we all lived. No, <coughs> no, I did an interview recently for was it Mojo or one of them Q? Did he, right? And he was trying to make it. He, he got it wrong actually. Well, the Stockholm Monsters were the first band out of Burnley to sign the factory when they were on Palatine Road. Right. But he said Oasis were the second band. They wasn't. Oasis were the third band. Who's the, the second? second? Molly Harfed. They were signed to Playtime Records, Manchester. And I then they Paul Barnsley formed another band called Wireless, and I signed them to. I signed a publishing when they were on Christmas in the nineties. So he is wrong. I'm right. Third, third band. And uh, Stockholm Monsters, I was checking them out. So they're Peter Hook producer. Yeah, I think. And um, like, how were they perceived in Burnish? Like, if they were the first band coming out, was no, it they, a big they, deal? Or they, they were like Nazis. Yeah. They were like they dressed like neo Nazis. Really? Yeah. Well, this is like seventies. It's yeah. like post punk. I mean, there was a couple of brothers called the Francis, Mark France, Tony France. Yeah, and he had like you know Bauhaus haircuts and man, man clothes. So yeah, it was, all, it was all, I was a mod at that time. So you got mods, mm -hmm. then you got punks, then you got Teddy Boys, and you got them neo Nazi weirdos. Well, they look weird. And you got all them within 
two streets of each other, and, all, and then everyone starts fighting. You know, it's, all pretty, it's all pretty mad. They, I mean, you see nowadays the kids walking on the street with leather vests, scorpions, t-shirts. Mm -hmm. It's like if you wore that in the seventies, you'd be killed. They had recorder solos as well. Huh? <laughs> recorder solos and like uh, like flute solos on the Stockholm Monsters. But on that yeah, means, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. It's pretty. Fair, uh, fair, I think I had fairy tales on seven inch. I think I still got it somewhere along the line. That was a good song. Do, 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 do. Okay, so what kind of stuff do you like from the last decade when you do, Jay? The last decade? Yeah. Which was what, the 90s? Well, no, I'd say like 2005. Do you, oh, do you pay anything nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. I, I don't, Nothing's I, kind of come on your horizon. No, I don't play anything here. Nothing. How I do you keep up with new music or do you not I don't, I don't, I, I can't be asked. Yeah. Why? There's, there's, there's not to listen to. I mean, the odd time I'll just scour and I'll have a look around and go, right, well, what? I'll have a little dig around on Spotify and see what's hot and I listen to it and I just go fuck is that it and I'm not playing that so I just turn myself off I refuse to play it what's the difference why is it not good now there's just no passion soulless it's all very safe all very middle class it is it's just it's just crap I mean it, it was you there was a band you got the black keys yeah. then you got the other fucking band we'll call the black somethings mm -hmm. I think since Kings of Leon since the first album Kings of Leon and the Liberty's first record, nothing, and that was what a decade ago, nothing. And I, I, I mean, I, I do try to listen, but it's just, I'm just too old. Can't be honest. Excellent. I'll get it. Cool. Um, let's talk about. Um, I, I, I've been doing a lot, bit, bit of research, and. Um, the night Paul Gallagher saved Paris. A lot of our listeners will be uh, uh, familiar with the night saved James. Saved Paris. Yeah, the, the night the night James Brown saved Boston. Well, the night Paul Gallagher saved Paris because I believe he had to do a DJ set just mm. after um, right. Oasis split up. In, yeah, in Paris. Was, tell us about that. I was, I was booked to play in the uh, in the after show in the in the tent next door to the the backstage, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they had the little tiff, and then that was all off, and everyone was scurrying around. And, and uh, yeah, I got I had the option to go to Milan with Liam. I had the option to uh, go back to Paris, Central Paris, or stay and do what I was supposed to do. So I stayed. Anyway, all the you know French, French journalists and this and that and the other and fucking. And then they, they wouldn't pay me till four in the morning. Oh, we all uh, you had the cancellation from your blah, 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 and all this fucking shit. So they won't pay me till four in the morning. But anyway, I did it and. Uh, yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit larry, but bollocks to them. So I, 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 I didn't cancel the gig. You, you were with them in the week running up to that, and mm. I think you said that Liam Noel turned up wanting World War IV uh, that night. Good band name, by the way. Um, tell us about that night. How did it, how did it kick off? Well, you know, yeah, it, we were on uh, the... Yeah. Where were we? We were at the City game the weekend, and then we had a day off in... Uh, I think it was Birmingham. We were on our way to do V. We did V in um, Staffordshire. We're on our way to cancel Chelsea. So I was supposed to go. Yeah, we cancelled. Well, but I didn't even know about that because on 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 the bus we were coming we were coming back from the Stafford gig and Liam was he was ill up he was ill because double double decker bus he was ill upstairs on the bus. So. Oh, was he really, like we always thought that? Oh, really? No, 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 no. That's bullshit. He, he generally was well, ill. Cause we were having a party downstairs singing uh, jam songs. There were about ten of us. Then he was upstairs asleep. So then we got to the hotel. He checked in and then I got a phone call when I woke up about 10 in the morning from Noel saying, um, V's off, go back to London. So we did. And then the next, then when we had to go to Paris, we got on the bus again and no Eurostar for us, by the way, on the bus. And then in, into Paris and then, I don't know, that was it. Yeah, now they, they, yeah, they, yeah. I, I always see them getting brought in on these the last legs of these tours. The same with PDI in Australia and Japan, brought in, bands split up. But anyway, bands split up. What are you fucking trying to tell me? Common denominator. Um, <laughs> did you? Is there any point where like you've been uh, kind of suggested that you might be able to reason with him being the older brother? Um, well, you, no, no, no there's, there's no reason. I mean, I speak to the pair of them. I see Liam nearly every other day, and I speak to Norman when, when I'm on his. Mm -hmm. On his little jaunts, uh, no, this, this, this is a big business and there's, 
I'm sure I'm sure it'll happen one day. There's too much money for it. Not so. Yeah. The, the, the Premier Bond. Um, so, regardless of what they say, <coughs> money talk. I met Bone a couple of years ago and he was basically just like, yeah, no one get out of the system. It's just all part of a he's, master he's, plan he's, to get he's, more together again. He was my DJ partner in Dublin. Was so that was interesting. Good night. <sighs> Amazing. He, he missed his plane the next day. We had two days. We gate crashed the <coughs> Irish Music Media Awards. Like you do. They want no bone in. I got him in. <coughs> got him in my guess. Actually, because he, he's quite close to Liam, and like obviously he was kind of sidelined from them in the late nineties, early two yeah, thousand. Yeah, like, we're still, we're still mates. Has he like yeah. been back in the loop? Yeah, no, no. We're we mates, you know. Our, our parents are from the same place, you know. And, you know we grew yeah. up. We grew up a couple of miles from each other. Just because things don't work out professionally doesn't mean you're not mates. So, yeah, I'm, so. I'm mates with Barnett, so it's fun. And if the band ever come to you for career advice, <laughs> no. Hold a brow. That, that, that doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't come into the. <coughs> no, 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 not not career advice. No. I'm afraid. No, I, I've I've been I've been I've helped out with. Um, I mean, I got Andy Bell in Oasis. I got, Did you? I got Jeff in BDI. And uh, I help I help Kasabian get on the get on the big stage with Oasis. Wish I didn't do that now, but anyway. Not a fan. No, not at all. First album was good. Rest. No, not 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 for me. They they have, I mean, how many albums are they on now? Six. Mm. Have they sold any records yeah. in any of them? Yeah. Have they sold out the Wembley Stadium? No, no, no. I mean, they, to me, they haven't done it. They've just moulded along. They're just nicking a living, if you, if you know. But anyway, good luck to them. Let them get on with it. Cool. Uh, that kind of brings us nicely onto the session musicians. In regards to you introduced, you say Jeff Wooten to yeah. Well, we, we got, yeah. I knew Jeff. I had a mutual friend. I knew Jeff from Manchester playing guitar in his bedroom, and I just asked him. Good player. Yeah. I just well, we were looking for a bass player, so I was figuring out which guitarist I could convert. Well, I had a success with converting Andy Bell, so I figured out to try the same tactic with Jeff. Paul, um, you're uh, very much the Scylla Black in the uh, BDI and uh, Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds uh, and Oasis. I haven't got uh, you to reckon. <laughs> so you found, you got a... Uh, speak like that, like, you know me. It's all right, it's all right. You, you, you got uh, Andy Bell the gig in Oasis mm. and you got Jeff the gig in, in BDI. What would you say is a good... Um, like if, if we're talking about session musicians I mean Oasis have seen off a fair few to be fair um, mm. well, I was yeah, at, well they were kind of members of the band weren't they they yeah. never really had sessions um, I was at the O2 sound check a couple of weeks ago and like Noel threatened to sack someone <laughs> after the first song really like yeah man just like I think slightly in jest but like the atmosphere I didn't, changed I didn't, I didn't go to that gig I was uh, how would you what gives an insight insight into working with big personalities obviously as an older brother it's different for you but advice to young musicians wanting to work with big personalities just make sure you work because you'll be fired if you don't it's as simple as that a big guy uh, most predominantly big, bigger bigger acts are setting the ways you know and if you want to survive do as you're told do as you're told um, the Inspiral sacked an old is that right yeah well yeah and no uh, yeah that was back in the in the uh, early 90s yeah we did diff different then I mean I think well, he auditioned to be the singer and got rejected for Tom fucking Ingley oh well <laughs> different back then I mean they wasn't to know was he so I think he, he just you know I mean that was the best thing that ever happened to him because then he had he seen Liam and he had time to do to join Oasis and then perfect the sound 
Um, you've done band management in the past. Um, how would you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how would you manage uh, Liam and Noel if you weren't an older brother to keep them together, to keep the, the brand going? You just got to keep the peace, really. And even that's not enough. You got, you, you got, you got to trust your instincts. I mean, they're both different people. I'd, I'd never get the chance to manage them because Noel will be. No manages himself technically. He just gets other people to do the work. And uh, yeah, Liam, Liam is managing himself. So I'm just there in an advisory capacity when required upon. Excellent. Um, okay, so let's go back to a bit of heritage um, in regards to your DJ and your your dad was a DJ as well. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, it was country and western DJ. Which Any is, crossover in what you play? No, not <laughs> not a fucking chance. He record. He used to record his shit off the radio and and and. and on on double tape, which which is kind of, you know, pre <clears throat> pre CD. I mean, it's, it's kind of intriguing watching him. He'd, he'd, he'd record. I mean, this is why my dad was was hilarious. He'd record Irish music off the radio, edit it, chop the fucking talking bits out, get me to go on my push bike down alongside market and sell them. Really? He'd, he'd have little labels on and sell his Irish mixtapes. This is about nineteen. This is in the 70s and I'd be like what the fuck so you'll take your nick in the music off the radio and selling it on genius I mean he must have sold about 100 maybe but kind of funny and uh, any kind of Irish music that's kind of bled into your kind of um, like I said any particular musicians that you like from the, from that area yeah I mean that... I, like, I like I like I still you know I'm into the Pogues I always have been yeah <clears throat> uh, in my younger days I was into the Wolf Tones with kind of a rebel band kind of a abolished now you can't really sing them anymore unless you get arrested uh, who else do I admire he's not really Irish but Mike Scott I love Mike Scott he's the only guy I, I pay in to see I actually buy a ticket physically I'm Ticketmaster to see Mike Scott I don't buy a ticket for anyone else but for him I do um, yeah I've got cousins who are Irish session fiddle players and all kinds of stuff so yeah it's, it's there you, can, you can't play with your DJ you get killed no point I know um uh, it's something you thought about in the past and like it's an ongoing project about possibly writing a book about um, kind of Irish uh, uh, immigration yeah immigration um, it's kind of all changed now though. I don't, I think it's, it's all changed it's interesting though man like it's safe. no but I think I think the way the, the European boundaries have come down that every, everyone's into mix now so it's not as it's not as prevalent nobody nobody really interested in the history anymore it's the same as <coughs> I read a book about the um, uh, Cromwell fucking raped Ireland and sent all the slaves to Barbados and it, there's, there's a book out there it's, it's, I think it's called To Hell To Hell or Barbados which is, which is an amazing book and it's, it's a period of history in Ireland that's never been told not even told in Irish schools that Cromwell come in fucking England da, 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 sent all the fucking white slaves to Barbados and that's why they call the red legs because they get the legs the legs got burnt in the sun right. and that's never been talking spoken about so that kind of interests me but You'd need millions to make a movie or anything on that because well, it, it costs you a fortune. Did, did your like your parents? Did they talk a lot about how difficult it was coming over? I mean, no, they, they, they had no choice. They, they, there, was no no, work. there was no work. There was no work. I mean, she, my mum was one of eleven. It's either fourteen years old, get on a train, get on a boat, come to England, work. That's just the way it was. <coughs> There's no work. There's still no work now. That's just the way it is. Um, my mum's parents were exactly the same. They came over in 1937, so a bit earlier. Um, yeah. And uh, my nan was one of nine. Uh, my granddad was one of 13. They came from uh, just outside Limerick. Um, and my granddad, his job in the Second World War was to, uh, to take down... They came to London and was to take down targets for Nazis from aerial places. So that he took down, like, Crystal Palace and that yes, kind of yes, thing. Yes, so he, he worked for the British Army because he, because he got three square meals a day. It, it, this war thing is totally ironic. Yeah. I mean, it's still going on now. It, it's it's amazing and no uh, my mum was uh, she was saying like when she used to go to school uh, she used to walk past placards that used to say like no blacks no Irish no dogs, dogs yeah, yeah. outside like, uh, well, that, like that, guest that, houses that, and that stuff that was the like. title that John Lydon's put on it oh was it yeah, oh right, no, right okay, right, no right, blacks man. no Irish no dogs yeah man yeah well yeah, they used to have that all, all, all over the place um, I think I only seen it in Manchester once when I was a kid but when the, when the IRA would do the bombings in 74 we, we used to get Irish pigs and the way she slagged off by kids at school. You Irish scumbaggers! I didn't bomb anyone. Yeah, but yeah, that, difficult. That's, yeah, difficult times in the seventies. You had power cuts. You had strikes. We didn't have central heat until about the eighties. I remember going to bed with a hot water bottle, fill your little bottle, got to bed, freezing under these furry blankets. <laughs> it's all it's all changed now. Everyone's got duvets. 
essentially. Yeah, crazy. Um, okay, so uh, where do you think uh, the Gallagher family or Gallagher family uh, would be if Alan McGee hadn't walked into King's Hut that day, or you hadn't given Noel your guitar? Well, he, he, he played it bare. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's just by chance, isn't it? I mean, they work well with each other. They, they helped McGee. McGee helped them. I mean, they were never really signed to Creation. They were do a license because the Sony deal went through. So technically, they were signed to Sony, but Sony's not too cool, so they were yeah. licensed to Creation. Uh, no, I, I DJ with Alan. He's, he's, he's a sound guy. He's, he's done a lot for our family. Oh, we've done a lot for him. So, but what? Vice versa. But where would you? Where would you? I mean, would you be living in London? Would your? No, you know, would your family? How? No, how would? It, what would, would you be doing? What would Noel Liam be doing? Fuck knows. Robin houses. Don't know. No, I think I think Noel as a genuine premium songwriter would have got where he wanted to be and I think I think Liam, Liam would have got where he wanted to be anyway so I mean there was, there, yeah there, there, was a, there was a few labels sniffing around him I mean there's a few people who who wouldn't give people in their, in their own labels 30 grand to sign away so it's 30 grand he said no 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 not worth 30 grand Creation picked him up for 35 and there you go I mean the rest is history the rest is history 30 grand they love a band like that now for 30 grand I tell you what was uh, like the extended family what was their view on them going into the music industry I mean was there anyone just like human thinking like I'll oh, get out of your system Liam and Noel and settle down and like get a proper job um, no I think, I think Liam when well, Liam was a kid when he, Liam was only 19 when he yeah. was born his bad Tw- 21 he was a millionaire so he just had a party for 20 years Noel seen a little bit more because he was he was on tour with the Inspirals. He toured the world with them. He, he knew a little bit more, and that's why he's 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 done the smart deals. What time? At what stage did the family start going? Oh, hang on, this is big. This is a big deal. Did the penny drop? I think uh, yeah. So I think it's ninety four. By the end of ninety four, the job was done. Wasn't it really? It sold out Am- Amersmith Pally, which is, a, which is closed now. But that was a big venue. They did they did the tour. They did the forum. He did America, he did this, he did that. I think 94, they were near enough there. 95 kicked the doors in. And then from there it went on. So, they they just that uh, Noel was so smart that he had the first two albums written anyway. And luckily enough that he just went, it all fell into place. With a little help from Liam and, you know, the rest of them. Cool. Um, I want to talk about the mid-90s. Um, to you, it might be something that was, you can't know, remember. you remember. Know, can't remember, can't, can't remember it. Pick a year. Pick a year. <coughs> okay, well, I'm going to just go back about um, j- uh, 10 years before that. You had the miners' strike, which affected Lancashire very much. Uh, it was remembered as a significant part in Thatcher's reign um, and referred to as a defining example in the golfing uh, class division. And a lot of artists in that time wrote songs about it. So you had Ghost Sound by the Specials, uh, yeah. Town Called Malice, yeah. um, then Stone Roses picked up the bat and they had like Elizabeth My Dear, Made of Stone, uh, yeah. Poll Tax Riots. <coughs> Smith's Queen is dead. Oh, there you go, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so this was a period where like there was a huge gulf between what was happening in modern music and the person in charge of the country. Because do you know what Margaret Thatcher said was her favourite song of all time when asked at the Brit Awards? No idea. How much is that doggy in the window? Uh, well there you go. I mean you got you got David, David Cameron jumping on the Smiths, it's like mate, do one. Fucking tough, you know. Do you think do you think they played that down the halls in Eton? The Queen is dead boy. Fuck do one. He's a he's a he's a charlatan if I've ever seen one. And four years before, you had Gordon Brown trying to claim that he was uh, no, a no, fan no. of the Arctic Monkeys. No, no, they're, they're all... They're, listen, they're, 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 it's, it's the, kind of the same as the major music labels where they they can't invest, they can't create youth culture, they invest in it. So they see labels doing well, they just buy it up. That's just the way of the world. That, that's what they've been doing for decades. So in the early 90s, uh, Oasis kind of picked up Stone Roses' <laughs> bat and, and with ridiculous levels of self-belief, did songs like Rock and Roll Star, which is kind of very aligned, interchangeable lyrics with, say, I Want to Be Adored. So it's kind of, there's, a, there's an alignment there. Yeah, and this whole... Better. It's way yeah, better. It's better. Fucking hell. Rock and Roll, st- rock and roll Star, I Want to Be Adored. There's no contest. Um, so this movement kind of snowballed and become a culture. You had, like, a British culture, you had, like, Train Spotting be nominated for Oscars, and that was a Britpop soundtrack. Damien Hirst's art was making waves across the Atlantic. I don't like that word, Britpop. Never have done. No, all oh, right. Horrible word. John Robb, I do like you, but that's his shit word. That was his... That was John Robb. That was it? John Robb. Britpop, British pop. Fucking hell, what, what were the Beatles? Were they Britpop? British pop. I, I just don't... It, it's a kind of degrading term. Yeah. So, well, to me it is, because it was just pop music. But they have to, journal, journalists have to write about something and go, oh, it was, you know, we've defined this era, it was called Britpop. So once you define an era, you just kill it. 
there's no point. Why don't you just enjoy the music and fuck all that shit? So this is what I want to play <coughs> you, Paul. Uh, this is uh, Oasis were kind of centric to all this, uh, whatever you want to call it, but they were they were centric to it, um, and it culminated in the moment that I'm about to play you uh, at the Brit Awards. Oasis were voted by the public as best group, and this was the same week that the Nebworth concerts were announced, and 2.6 million people applied for tickets. And in their uh, acceptance speech, Noel said this. There are seven people in this room tonight who are giving a little bit of hope to young people in this country. That is me, our kid, Bonehead, Quigsy, Alan White, Alan McGee and Tony Blair. And if you've all got anything about you, you get up there and you shake Tony Blair's hand, man. He's a man. Power to the people! The must have worked that night, our kid. How did you feel at the time when Noel was kind of getting in bed with like, because you didn't know at the time it was Good World, but with Tony Blair and like Alistair Campbell just saw it as an opportunity to go on the coattails. Yeah, and of course. I mean, I, I did just, you realise he was being played? I, I just sort of noticed it. I mean, because I, I think the I was the time I moved to London and I knew if I didn't buy a, buy a property, I, I knew when, when there's an election there's always an, an upturn in fortunes and mm -hmm. I figured that he'd get in. So I'd, I'd, I'd need to buy a house quick before it went up, so I did. So uh, thank you for that, Mr. 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 Tony Blair. But for everything else, war criminal and all that sh sugar. Within a year of Noel saying that, Tony Blair was in power as the youngest ever prime minister in 200 years, and he had the largest majority vote of people on the 30. I've I've never I've never voted, and then not voted for Labour since since the 80s in Manchester. I just, you know, they're not a socialist party. They're not left field. They're just they, they're just basically yeah. the fucking Tories. With a red badge on. Yeah, you're right. They're, they're all the same. I mean, I'm, I'm voting next week for the first. I think, don't think I've ever voted in London, but I am going to vote. I'm going to vote for the Green Party. Good man. <clears throat> because I like juices. There we go. Outside Planet Organic. I'm going to vote for the Green Party. What about Trident? What fucking about Trident? You think that's going to stop the Russians? Some fucking silly little thing? No one. What how about mending the fucking pavements in the not so rich places? Hey, fucking hell. Councils. <laughs> Cool. Um, all right, let's talk about, if you don't mind me, just uh, your relationship with Liam and Noel. Um, the press always talk about Liam and Noel's relationship, but I would say without question, you have more inf you've had more influence on Liam than Noel ever possibly could have. I mean, metal three of you, the way your your mannerisms, the way you are. Do you think that's because you, um, the older brother, he looked up to you? Did you look out for him, Liam as a kid? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, we Noel had left home by the time he was um, seventeen. He'd, he'd, he'd gone where he's gone. And there was only me and Liam there. Liam was a kid, so and, and that was kind of it. And we, we live we're two miles away from each other. We see each other. We talk to speak every day. We see each other a couple of times a week. So yeah, he's my younger brother, isn't he? I mean, my youngest brother. So you have got to look out for you know you got to look out for your family. Noel can look after himself, but you know Liam, you know what you do. He never liked guitar bands, but you got him into him. Is that right? Yeah, Liam, Liam, didn't, Liam just loved scratching my records taking him to primary school. And I was like, yeah, mate, do you know how fucking many holes I've had to dig to buy that fucking record and you've gone and scratched it? Oh, you're about dickhead. He's like, what am I on about dickhead? Come here. And we just start fighting. Seven years old or not. Don't fucking nick my records. So what was he into? Do, don't scratch them. I think it was a, in a break dancing. Fuck <laughs> off. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, 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 wait, wait. Hey, hey, there's a lot, a lot of shit. Uh, uh, seven year old Liam Gallagher break dancing. Listen, I remember him break dancing. I remember Noel dressed as a rockabilly. We haven't, we haven't got the pictures, so we, we didn't have a camera back in, the, in them days, but yeah. Oh, that's where the... Uh... It wasn't all mods. I was the fucking mod. So but Noel anyway. was dressed as a rockabilly? That's where he, the new version of uh, Fade Away comes from. He was a rockabilly. <laughs> Liam used to spin his head with a bit of lino. I was just... That was my nickname, Bod the Mod. So, there you go. Cool. But, but now I kind of cringe when I see all these kids with parkers on thinking it's the 70s. I'm like, ugh. Fuck off. But you've had a lot of influence because I know you're really into clothes, like as a as a young person, yeah. and like you, you, the guitar and your musical taste. Do so you have quite a lot of oversight in like Liam's development? How have you seen him change? Because now he obviously owns his business pretty green, and that's a fashion. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's just sold another store in Tokyo, so that makes sense. I think about eight in Japan. No, he's doing he's doing well. That clothing company, it were all its knockers at the start, is turning over a serious amount of money. So, I mean, fair play to him. You know, he's stuck at it. And he's doing his thing. Uh, yeah, I've seen him go from a boy to a man. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of weird watching your, your youngest brother go from living at home with your mum to living with Patsy Kenzie in about the space of two years, and you're like going, "Wow!" And then, you know, and then you go on tour with them, and they're 
like he gets he gets mobbed man all you see he's open he's just turn up it's, it is kind of mental to get your red round but you know once you that's his thing just let him get on with it that's what he's got to do that's his job so it's all good cool and uh, in regards to Noel um, I'm always interested in how like say Peggy for instance saw him as like the, uh, you referred to uh, Peggy calling him the uh, mummy's little blue eyed boy how did like all the naughty stuff go down with the rest of the family did they kind of brush it off or was that well, kind of well I mean it was because we, we started off collecting scrapbooks way back in the day 91 I think my mum's got about 70 now she must have I mean for all and then you know obviously she'd buy every paper and she'd cut out the bits and she'd be looking at it going Oh, well, that's not a very clever thing to be saying. No. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, she, he, my brother's kind of opened her. I mean, she's, she's very streetwise for a 70 odd year old woman. She knows everything about drugs. Because they, they kept mentioning it. You know, it's like. Conflicts and all that. Spring, yeah, yeah, and it's like my mum's like going, you better not be on them. I said, listen, I'm a saint. It's not me. So that, so that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it opened her eyes to, to all kinds of shenanigans. Good and bad. I want to move on quickly. I know you're really into um, Motown stuff. You talked about Motown stuff. Well, I mean, DJ. yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, in, always good. Yeah. yeah, I'm more into Northern, the stompers of Northern Soul, not really the the slow ones. I've, I've done a, I've done the Northern Soul night, which I did say to the promoter, I said, "Don't bill me as a Northern Soul DJ because I'm in Scunthorpe and they got this bouncy floor, and I know it's their big night out, and they pay three pound in, and that's a fucking lot of money for them, and they're going to get on my case if I don't play any Northern Soul." Which I probably don't, predominantly don't. So anyway, went there, fucking hell, they're eating pie and peas, and they're fucking like, hey, you know what, our dance floor is empty. I said, yeah, because you're all eating food. He went, no, because you're not playing any North at all. And I went, listen, fuck you. So the next track I did, but it was a stomper, and there was a geezer sat in the corner with his fans falling going, no, this is, this is not what I pay me money in for. Yeah. I was like, fuck you, I, I can't go cater into some old geezer who used to bounce around when he was fucking 20, when he's now in his 60s, and he's got a hip replacement. I, I can't do that. I think you said the song that gets people on the dance floor most is "I Want You Back." Jackson yeah, Five, is that right? Well, no, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't, I didn't predominantly start. I think I played the Jacksons one night by mistake because I don't sometimes wear earphones and I sometimes don't. So I think <laughs> I pressed them by accident. Yeah, <laughs> and it, and the place went fucking mental. And I was like, going, oh shit. Like so, yeah. No, I, I, no, I don't play that anymore. I, I carry "Don't Stop" till you get enough. That's kind of always handy because girls dance to it. And while girls are dancing, guys ain't leaving that dance floor because they're going to be stood next to girls. So it's a win-win situation, and you just see them going. I don't really want to dance to this, but I will because it's fucking great. It's a great tune. Um, so you know. Let me ask you, Barry Gordy, the guy who ran Motown, mm. he uh, his instruction to his songwriters was, "I want the listeners to know who the song is by in the first four bars, mm. even if they can't name the song, mm. right?" And you'll hear it. You say you accidentally lined up a song, and people went wild for it. Can I ask you, right? Do you think Noel does that a lot with his kind of chord structures and that kind of thing? Like, I, I think it gigs it is, and like, he'll start playing If I Had a Gun or Riverman on the last mm. tour, and there's like an outbreak of cheering, assuming it's Wonderwall. Do you yeah. think it's like product placement a bit? I, no, I, 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 it's not like calculating, no? I don't think he, I don't think he thinks like that. I mean, he's going to have to play Wonderwall in America because he's going, like, hey, you're the Wonderwall guy, because Americans are like fucking uh uh-uh, when it comes to music. But, um,. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's exactly the same as Wonderwall. Do you know that? Like, exactly I, the same. I, I just think with Motown, they just sounded like they were having a good time. Yeah. Everyone. You, you, you can pick any you know, any soul song from the 60s, early 60s to early 70s. They all sounded like, they were probably penniless and on the street, but they all sounded like they were having a good time. Whereas nowadays, everyone fucking sounds like they're depressed. And they've probably got a better time than they had. I don't know. Good point, good point. Um... You once said that Noel looked at Liam as a youngster and to a certain extent wished it could be him in regards to being a front man. Um, do you think that's still the case now? Well, I mean, Noel is a, well, he's a front man now in his own thing, but he's not a front man if you know what I mean. He's like a Johnny Marr and he's, you know, he's a side man being a front man. And it, it, there's, there's, more, there's more to just getting up there and singing being a front man. And you, 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 I mean, I do notice a difference. I watch Noel's band to going out with BDI and he's completely complete opposites and now Liam just whatever he does which is predominantly nothing on the stage the crowd are mental and no more so than Rome Rome last year was probably the best gig I've seen for, I mean the gig for the band wasn't amazing but the crowd is just fucking so mental they kicked the doors in then there was a power cut then there was a stage invasion 
all in one Sunday night on the outskirts of Rome. And it's just because of his presence. I'm afraid, I mean, Noel's got the songs, but he hasn't got Liam's presence, and he, and, and, he, and he won't, he'll never have it. They're just different. Together, together they conquered the world. Apart, no, not as much. What's your thoughts on his new album? I mean, I bought it so I can slag it off. I paid 13 quid for the deluxe version. Didn't get a free one. Bought me own. Uh, there's a few okay songs on it. It's not really my cup of tea, I mean, really. I, I like, you know, I like things a bit more up. I've, you know, it, it, it's a Noel album. It's not an Oasis album because I don't think Liam could sing, sing any of them songs, really. I mean, Lock of the Doors was an early Oasis demo. Oh man, he's, 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 which he's, I, I, he's I, pissed I, away in Lock of the Doors and Liam would tear that up, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. I just think there's something missing in that record, Liam. But anyway, that's, that's, that's the arguments for another day. Right, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Oasis do 10 gigs, Liam's voice, doing world tours. There's nothing wrong with his voice. Towards the end of tours? Come on. Yeah, towards Live. the end of tours, but I mean, you, I mean, how, how, how many shows are they doing? No, you've got to understand that they do yeah. 130, 140 gigs. I'll put anyone up to say that your voice isn't going to be fucked after 130, 140 gigs on the road, travelling overnight, air conditioning hotels is always a problem. Every, every front man will have a problem with air conditioning hotels, even if you turn it off. Yeah. There's always a problem, bugs, planes, this, that. This, 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 that's just fucking, not, you watch, will you watch when Noel goes to America? If there's a few shows in the middle of fucking nowhere that he can't get to and his voice is, he'll cancel. That's yeah, just right. part and parcel yeah. of the job. There's just no way you can be pristine for 140 shows. And I don't care who you are. And um, everyone talks about like if Liam's written a lot, lot of lyrics about Noel and vice versa. Are there any lyrics over the years that you've said, oh, I think that's about me or little no, references to you? Be, no, no? No, I think I got, I got one dedication in my entire life. And that was because 1994, I commandeered, oh, in fact, let's get the proper story here. I met two kids in Nottingham Rock City, and he said, are you going to America to see Oasis at the, uh, I think it was the Wetlands and the CMJ Music Festival? And I said, no, I'm not, so I can't afford it. I think I was on a dollar at the time, and he says, all right, well, we'll get your fare, we'll pay your fare if you can get us in the gig. And I says, fucking cool, no brainer, innit? So I got, I, got the, I got the bus, not the train, I got the bus to Luton, and he picked me up and I went to Windsor, stayed at his house. Then we got the, we got Virgin, you can still smoke on the plane, so I'm on the piss with these fucking two kids. Virgin Airline, fucking Aerostasis, da da da. Get in there, and I think the gig was in New Jersey. I walked through the door, Liam's like, fucking hell. This is cigarettes and alcohol for our kid. I don't know how we fucking got here, but he's it. And I had the best week of my life. Fucking brilliant. And, uh, and I think um, I've seen the two guys back at the airport. They didn't have a great time. I think they, uh, their mate had left them in the loop. They had to sleep in doorways while I was in this girl's posh apartment on Central Park West. I had a great time with them. <laughs> they didn't have such a great time, but uh, yeah, no, no, that was that was the only dedication I've ever had, I think. They, 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 they all seem to forget about me. So I'm not just let me on with it. Let's talk football. Yeah. First game you went to was with Noel, I think. Yeah, Newcastle, 60 odd. And you he used said to get him for free, is that right? Did you, did yeah, no, because the City, they used to have a free quarter time where they opened the turnstiles after 75 minutes. <laughs> after 75? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my dad, being a cheapskate, he'd say, come, if it's, you know, come on, we'll go to the match. So we'd leave at kickoff time. And by the time we got there, because he'd make us walk there, <laughs> so that'd be like three miles. So we walked to the game, we get in 75 minutes, and if it's nil nil, he goes, ah, you haven't missed anything. And we'd be like, you made us walk three miles, and then you watch the final fifteen minutes and go back out again. Oh, there's a lot of stuff. It, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of embarrassing. How was it seeing uh, Liam and Noel eventually go and kind of play, playing play, there? Yeah, playing main road. Yeah, that, 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 that was that was a bit of a mad night. That was, that was the same night as Ramadan. Was <laughs> it? Yeah. So you got like thirty-five thousand yeah. fans coming out to the streets of Moss Side, predominantly you have to go through Rush Home where you've got the Asians slaughtering lambs on the street. Really? You, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was, it was cool. kind of a bit hectic. Yeah, no, if, yeah that, I think that was a good gig. You I said mean, the City of Manchester gigs at 2005 are good ones, you said that. Yeah, they, was they, yeah, they, 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 they were fairly good. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, uh, the, most of the big outdoor shows have been good. At, so I, I just don't like Wembley Stadium. I just don't, there's just something about that stadium that's not right. It's soulless there, man. So yeah, vacuous. Yeah, well, even, even, even the old one. Even for concerts, it's just, 
I just don't think bands should play Wembley Stadium. Go and find a big fucking field and don't play Hyde Park either. Mm. You know, go and, go and play somewhere else. Um, talking about filling out stadiums by playing there live, uh, you play Gaelic football, Croke Park, is that right? Yeah, me and Noel played in the same team in uh, 83 against Kilmacle Crokes, who were probably the champions of Dublin at the time. We played two games, one at their ground and one at Croke Park, and then we did an exchange. Yeah, I have. I can't remember too much about it. I think we were drunk on the way over. We were only kids, so yeah. But a lot of your lot work of now is like to do. So you like the Secret Gallagher in the Secret Footballer series, is that right? Yeah. And yeah, do you know well, the Secret Footballer is? Yeah, can't tell you. Really? Do you know? Yeah, of course I do. Uh, I am. I'm. I've sworn. I've no, signed, no, I've sorry. signed a confidentiality agreement. Serious? Yeah. <laughs> I, it, which reminds me, I haven't written anything for a bit. They were on my case the other day, but I was in Germany. I was like, mate, I mean, not fits there, right? Anything. So. Uh, and talk, to, to you. talk to us about the dark days of being an athletics correspondent for Sky Sports. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, how did that? Happen? Well, yeah, uh, because who happened? Uh, there's a mate of mine called Harry Pratt, who's mates with Death in Vegas, and I met him through another mate, and he says, "Do you want to do you want to work for Sky?" And I'm thinking, "Where the fuck is Sky?" And I found out I was in Osterley, which is the dark ass end of anywhere. So it used to take two and a half hours to go to work oh, per man. day, and then I started off in football, but then everyone wanted to do football, so I got. You're boxing got, as well, didn't you? I got. St- I ended up doing the boxing. Yeah, well, it was me who started the tail of the tapes and all that shit. And um, yeah, I did athletics. Don't know why. I just got shafted in to do sports that nobody give a shit. I just thinking, you know what I mean? I'll do sports that nobody cares about because therefore nobody will nick me stories. Good thinking. Yeah. So um, drugs in athletics and things like that. Is the story in Tony McCarroll's book true that um, Liam used to clean Man United players' cars? In the yeah, car yeah, park? yeah. He used to work. He used to work for. Um, um, he used to work with a guy called Baz. He calls himself the Biggin, but he's Paul Ashby, and he used to um, valet footballers' cars, predominantly United ones, for Mark Hughes, Cantona, all that kind of stuff. Because City players didn't have any cars. I think he had horse, horse and cart back then. So yeah, there's, there's a story that um, on his first day, his mates um, said, "Right, you've got to go up to Mark Hughes' front door yeah, and yeah. give him the receipt." Uh-huh. Do you know this? Right, <laughs> and on the receipt, it's yeah. supposed to obviously say the money. But he's opened it up and they stitched him up, yeah. and it says, "I really like your curly hair." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, mate, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that happened, but uh, yeah, he did use to valet cars and do shit like crazy, that. Crazy, crazy. Okay, um, let's begin to wrap up. Um, as a DJ, what yeah, what advice would you give to people um, on a difficult night if nothing's happening? You know, is it just to lay down the biggest tune you got, or young musicians and, and young DJs? Uh, I mean, what's the... there's there's a few ways of looking at it. Not everybody can dance it. So if you see kind of a semi-empty dance floor and you're thinking, there's, there's a lot of people at the back listening. So you, you kind of got to... Uh, I, I never just drop a big tune just just for the sake of dropping a big tune because that would be fake because therefore you need another big tune after it, another one, another one, another one. So if you drop something that you don't normally play, you're expected to carry on that shit. So I, I'd rather I'd rather just wait around. I mean, I, I predominantly get it. I've got it right. I mean, I've got a two-hour set at the moment that's pretty fucking banging, to be fair, and it's pretty... Fu- I mean, you might get a lull when I stick on rappers they're like 14 minutes and they're going yeah I'm fucking sick of this I say really well you wait till I give you 22 minutes of fucking Noel Falling Dan remix yeah. and you'll be pissed off then won't you no I mean and, yeah. D- and DJ Wars uh, yeah, one of the quotes while I was in Paris was yeah. uh, something you said which is he can't fucking follow reggae <laughs> do you well, remember that? yeah no they, they, I mean ev- everyone's a DJ these days I mean I've, when I started out in the 80s there was no fucker was a DJ well, apart from the big, big DJs, and you won't get a chance to play anywhere. But these days, with USB sticks and downloading, and everything, everybody I know in the world is a DJ. I mean, it's ludicrous. So that's why I, I kind of step back from it for, for a bit because I don't, I don't work in London if I can help it. I help my mates out sometimes, but it's just. It's, How much it feel like a job to you now? It's not a job. You can never. If if it becomes a job, time to give it up. How much you still love it? I love it and hate it at the, at the same time. I love it, but then I hate it. Because you just know, it's just, it's just, it's, you're just travelling, it's a, a different crowd. You don't oh, know, true. They're all drunk, but predominantly, you don't know what to expect. I mean, the, the, the thing that I hate about the after shows is people seeing cameras in your face, blinding you with them cars, these flashes inside them camera phones. And I, I, I mean, I have to take eye drops on a DJ because. I just can't see it. And I, you know, and I say to them, I say, listen, turn your flash off. And they're all drunk, like, rah, 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 
fucking still doing it. Yeah, and they blind you. So while they're blinding me, getting their picture of me that I don't want a fucking picture anyway to put on fucking Facebook and Twitter, you've blinded me so I can't see what I'm fucking doing. So yeah, I kick off, and you know, what can you do? You know, and I keep going, oh, you complaining for? I'm complaining because I can't see. Fucking hell, I have got a right for my eyes, you know. So yeah, and these these phones ain't helping, and new new computer screens they're just fucking with my eyes. So yeah, I've got I've got. You sound like a job to me, Paul. Well, no, it's not a job. <laughs> I complain less about my job, and it's ain't as good as your one. No, no, it's just slight complaints, you know, complaints and I don't know. Promoters, promoters. Is any pressures touring that no, we don't see? No, it's fine. You know, it, 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 it's it just just sometimes if you got two or three on a bounce on the late nights and you've had no sleep, and it, you know, I, I apologise to the people of Cologne that didn't play Oasis, every, you know, every time. But fuck me. I don't, when was that? How long ago was that? Oh, it was about five years ago, but it still slagged me off. It still slagged me off now. And when I was in Dusseldorf, that I did notice a couple from Cologne, and they were predominantly asking me about Oasis. I was like, go and check your fucking ticket. What does it say? It doesn't say I'm fucking gonna play every song Oasis, does it? Now do one. So yeah, you just have a look. You just you know whatever. Finally, um, what? Where does your like? How does your current day to day life align with the ambitions you had as a kid? What did no, you want to be? Completely and where you different. Now? I mean, I think as a kid we just wanted a job that paid decent money in Manchester. I think that's what everybody wanted, and then obviously. The phenomenon that that was the that Oasis come along that changed everything. So now I'm just kind of happy enough. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing, just fucking about. Where are you next, DJing? Where's next on the road? You going? Oh, I'm not. I'm not doing anything till with Noel. I'm not doing anything with him till July. Uh, Clapham. I think we're sourcing venues at the moment. Clapham, uh, Castlefield. Uh, so this is. I mean, it, it does kind of turn into a business, even if you don't want it to. Because if I don't do an after show, I know someone else is going to do it. So it's kind of you know I've got I've got a little lineup in my mind for Manchester, pretty good. So I've got to go and I've got to now become a promoter and source other DJs and pay them, and I've got to become the boss. And I'm like, how the fuck did that happen? I just become a DJ. Now I've got to promote it, which is, is kind of new because I usually have promoters in place where I go. Someone will ring me up and we go, yeah, 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 da, 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 and it's taken care of. But now. Some of them, I have to do it myself, which doesn't quite sit well. You've got to DJ and promote at the same fucking time from 200 miles away. But anyway, yeah, we've, we've got something in place for Clapham. I'm going to team up with uh, This Feeling, the club night in London. We're going to do something in Clapham, hopefully. Uh, Manchester, uh, Cork one, I think has already gone on sale. Uh, where else? Italy, I think me and McGee are looking at doing the three, three festivals in Italy together. And before that, I've got someone asked me to do a private party in... Belgium in June. Cool. You done? A, you were at Belgium for a couple of years, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I had I started a club night with a with a young Belgian kid called P- Peter Vabiki called Hindu Nights, which is still going. And we did that for a few years. And then, yeah, the music policy changed, and I was like, no. Nah. If you're going to do it the same as every other fucking club in the world, carry on. And that's not what I do. I'm, I'm not changing. I'm not going to change the music I like just to DJ in Belgium. No. So uh, they carried on doing their thing, and I, I just went the other way. So it's, it's all fine. Cool. Final question: What's Liam's next move? No idea. Probably, probably eating eating ch- fish. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. What, everyone thinks he's doing a solo album. I, I have no idea. He hasn't mentioned it to me. So you seen him tomorrow? Seen him tomorrow. Yeah, we will. We'll go for a leisurely stroll across the heath and uh, get in touch with Ashcroft. That's all that. Ashcroft? No, he's a red. Can't be working with United fans. Not good sign. Red and blue don't mix. Red and blue, you're better dead than red. <laughs> good way to finish. Thanks, Paul. All right, no problem. Thanks for having us. Cheers, Alan Deck. <laughs>